St. Basil's Church on the campus of the University of St. Michael's College in downtown Toronto, the National Catholic Broadcasting Council presents Daily Mass. The televising of today's Mass is made possible by a contribution from three anonymous donors. The first is from Cornwall, Ontario, for the living and deceased members of her family, for young people to return to church for peace in the world. The second is from Edmonton, Alberta, in thanksgiving for blessings received for the televised daily mass and the priests who celebrate it, for her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and relatives, for the souls in purgatory, and for a holy death for herself. The third is from Sudbury, Ontario, for improved health, for the return of three of her children to their faith, and for peace between two of her children. Our thanks to all our donors for the gift of this Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us now acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who made your people partakers in your redemption, grant, we pray, that we may perpetually render thanks for the resurrection of the Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with proclaiming the word, testifying to the Jews that the Messiah was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him, in protest he shook the dust from his clothes and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshipper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the official of the synagogue, became a believer in the Lord. Together with all his household and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul became believers and were baptized. The word of the Lord. Victory, he has. 
has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. The Lord has revealed to the nations his saving power. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father, he said to his disciples, A little while, and you will no longer see me, and again a little while, and you will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying to us, A little while, and you will not longer see me? And again a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. They said, what does he mean by this a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, are you discussing among yourselves what I meant when I said, a little while, and you will no longer see me. And again a little while, and you will see me. Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn. But the world will rejoice. You will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. The Gospel of the Lord. Over the last several days, our readings from the Acts of the Apostles have focused on the missionary activity of Paul and his companions. The pattern as they move from city to city has tended to be the same. They go first to the local synagogue, where they proclaim Jesus to their fellow Jews as the Messiah of Israel. Then they turn to non-Jews, initially to those who in some way are attracted to the synagogue, and then to those who are not. Yesterday's reading described Paul in a public setting at the heart of Athens. On Monday, we heard of his encounter with Lydia and the other women on the bank of a river in Philippi. The focus on Tuesday was on how even in prison Paul was able to preach and to win people for Christ. In today's reading he comes to Corinth, the site of one of the great cities of classical Greece. Destroyed by the Romans, it was later rebuilt by them. By the time that Paul arrives there, the population had grown considerably and is extremely mixed, both ethnically and religiously. 
On his arrival in the city, Paul encounters a married couple, Aquila and Priscilla, Jewish Christians who have recently come from Rome. They become friends with Paul and support him in his work. Here is elsewhere, Paul begins with the Jewish community. Some accept his message about Jesus, while others reject it. The phrase, your blood be on your own heads, was a traditional way of saying, the responsibility is yours. He then turns to the Gentiles, among whom he achieves greater success. Paul remains in Corinth a year and a half, during which he helps to build up a small but fervent Christian community. We know more of the church in Corinth and of Paul's relations to it than of any other Christian church. Two or more years after leaving Corinth for Ephesus, Paul was moved to write at least three letters to the community, of which two have come down to us. They reveal serious tensions in the Corinthian church and between it and Paul. Over the last decade or more, I've taught a course at St. Michael's College in alter alternative years entitled Scripture in Christian Tradition. After a broad and general introduction to the Bible and the history of its interpretation, we focus in the second term on one of the Gospels and one of Paul's letters. The one I've chosen most often has been his first letter to the Corinthians. Like all of Paul's letters, it is very much an occasional writing. He writes it in response to various reports that have come to him of moral failings in the church in Corinth, as well as of tensions and conflicts which are undermining its community life. In addition, members of the Corinthian church have written their own letter to Paul, containing questions about issues and practices which are causing considerable debate among them. The first thing that Paul's letter to the Corinthians reveals is a simple but important truth, namely that the church was never perfect, not even in the enthusiastic period of its beginnings. Believers in Corinth, for example, are forming into groups in opposition to one another, some identify with Peter, others with Paul, and others again with Apollos, a preacher and teacher who came to Corinth subsequent to Paul's leaving. In Paul's mind, the Corinthians are turning things upside down. Christianity is not a matter of individual preachers and teachers, but of the gospel, the gospel of salvation through the death and resurrection of Jesus. What then is Apollos? The apostle asked. What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Paul is disheartened to hear of a case of incest in the community against which no one is reacting. Others are going to secular courts because they are unable to resolve money matters among themselves. 1 Corinthians contains many of Paul's reflections on marriage. They've often been misunderstood because people have not recognized that a number of the things he says are in fact quotations of what is being said in Corinth. The most famous of these is the phrase, it is well for a man not to touch a woman. Those who affirm this so emphasize the soul over the body that they end up declaring that even married people should refrain from sexual intercourse. Paul rejects the notion out of hand as both naive and as against the very nature of marriage. Paul addresses abuses that have grown up in regard to the Eucharist. At the time, it was still celebrated within the context of a meal. Unfortunately, the meal has become a source of division, as the well-to-do arrive early and eat rather sumptuously, while slaves and workers, when they do arrive, have to wait for them to finish. 
Such a practice, Paul says, is not the Lord's Supper. Rather than building up the church, it undermines and threatens to destroy it. Throughout the letter, Paul reveals himself as intensely involved in and concerned about the life of those who make up the Corinthian church. He compares his attitude to them to that of a father who loves and cares for his children and who only wants to serve their well-being. The letter fills out and makes more concrete the events recounted in the Acts of the Apostles. The two together, Acts and Paul's letter, offer a remarkable portrait of the early Christian community in one city and of the Apostle whose preaching called it into existence and who continued to be so passionately committed to its well-being. Let us now in faith and trust present before God our needs. For all of us that are sharing in this Eucharist will deepen our faith in and commitment to the gospel. Let us pray to the Lord. For the intentions of our donors and of those who have asked us to pray for them, let us pray to the Lord. For an end of war, violence, and terror, especially in Syria and in Africa, let us pray to the Lord. For the elderly and the chronically ill and for those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. For our deceased relatives and friends and those who have died this past night, that they will be brought to eternal life in God, let us pray to the Lord. Gracious God, we ask you to hear and grant these prayers as well as the more personal ones that each one of us has in his or her own heart. All this we pray through Christ our Lord. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. For the mingling of this water and wine, become partakers of his divinity, keep partaker of our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we've, uh, we, we have received the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Gracious God, we ask you to sacrifice with you, wash me from my sins, cleanse me from my iniquity. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be made acceptable to God the Father Almighty. May our prayers right up, rise up to you, O Lord, together with the sacrificial offerings, so that purified by your graciousness, we may be conformed to the mysteries of your mighty love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. With your Lift up your hearts. Up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but in this time, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously when Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. For he is a true lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. By dying, he has destroyed our death, and by rising, restored our life. Therefore, overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exults in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts Sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim.
are indeed holy, O Lord, the font of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which shall be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more, giving thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have saved. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Thomas, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that through the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not upon our sins, but upon the faith of your Church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. And let us offer each other the sign of peace. Peace. Have mercy.
Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who restore us to eternal life in the resurrection of Christ, increase in us, we pray, the fruits of this Paschal Sacrament and pour into our hearts the strength of this saving food. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May the Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. to three donors, the first an anonymous donor from Cornwall, Ontario, the second an anonymous donor from Edmonton, Alberta, and the third an anonymous donor from Sudbury, Ontario. And it's their generous contributions that made the televising of today's Mass possible. Please remember that all requests for special prayers are read by Father Bush, Father Coots, Father Donovan, and Father Fitzpatrick, and your intentions are carried with them to the altar for the celebration of Holy Mass.